Man, I hope that is true for your life. And if it's not, I want to tell you today, it can be true for your life. That Jesus can be all that you need. If you have your copy of God's Word this morning, you can open up to the book of Jude. We've been there for the last several weeks. If you want to know where that's at, go all the way to the end, turn left, and you'll find it. That's where we will be this morning. This extended weekend provides the opportunity for us to remember those who sacrificed in the past for the greater good of those in the future. The past reveals that good cannot coexist with evil. The past reveals the evils of societies that pervert and exchange good for selfish aims. The past reveals that it is still relevant because the rejection of its lessons will result in a necessary struggle. So, if it's easy to understand those concepts in relationship to what we call Memorial Day, why do we struggle, and I mean why do we struggle to apply these truths to the spiritual nature of our life? Maybe like this holiday, we need to be reminded of what is supremely important. And so that's why today we're going to continue our series on the ones, those small one-chapter books of the Bible. This morning we are taking our third look at Jude, where he will warn us to not turn the grace of God into licentiousness. And so the question for us as we start this morning is this. Are you willing to be the greater good that the world needs today? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I pray that you will be all that we desire, that we will proclaim that you are all that we need. God, I pray that we will see that you and you alone are the sole solution for a world that hurts struggles and doesn't understand. And God, I pray that you will help us to see that we are a part of your plan. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, Jude, chapter 1, because that's all there is, we're going to start with verse 4 this morning. And this is what he writes. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turned the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So as I have said over the last couple of weeks, it is pretty much accepted that Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. He is the younger brother of James, who wrote the letter that bears his name, and was also the leader of the early church in Jerusalem. Now, a lot more seems to be known about James for those very reasons. His work in the new early church. I mean, we read about him not just in his letter, but in the book of Acts. But Jude, on the other hand, well, Jude's letter comes several decades later. It helps the people of not the new church, but the ever-expanding church churches to understand the work of God in their culture and how they should respond. So he's speaking to those people and what they need to hear. So Jude starts with what's most important. He talks about the salvation that we have in common. We read about that in verses 1 and 2, and that's where he starts. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Last week, Jude told us to contend earnestly for the faith that's been handed down to us. And today, this week, Jude is going to warn us about turning the grace of God into licentiousness. Now, I know, big words, we're going to unpack those for us this morning. And to do that, here's the first thing that I want us to look at. Jude says people think that they can coexist with wrong and be right. Let that, let's think about that. A problem that they had then, I'm going to say, a problem that we have now, that we think that we can coexist 
with what's wrong and be right. The phrase crept in unnoticed means to come alongside under a false pretense, an attempt to be something that you're not, to come in on the sly, to pretend to be something that you're not, often with not a good intention. Some in the early church thought that they could claim Christ and live like those who reject Christ. However, Jesus shares this with us in the book of Matthew. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. Now, you might not like that. I mean, that's an either or, and we're much more of a, well, a plus and and kind of people. But that's what scripture tells us. We will love one and be devoted to that one, or we will hate the other, that we can't do both. The phrase crept in unnoticed also includes the idea of stealthiness. It's used in Greek culture to imply thievery. So these people who crept in unnoticed, this, pa this word paints this word picture of they slip in through the side door, if you know what I'm meaning. They don't come in through the front door. They slip in through the side door with this nefarious motive that they're coming to rob. And if you've ever had something stolen, that's not a really cool feeling, is it? It's kind of a sucker punch. Your stuff was there, and now it's gone. It has impacted you. It has impacted other people. And so Jude is telling us that when we think that we can coexist, what we're really saying is, well, our actions, as sneaky or unsneaky as they might be, are going to harm us, and they are going to harm other people. You might think, well, how do they cause harm to other people or us? Well, they cause harm because when we're this way, when we try to coexist, what we do is we try to justify our behavior. Oh, we're not being wrong. This is my excuse or my reasoning of how I'm not being wrong. I'm being right, right? That impacts us because deep down when we make lies like that, we know we're lying, right? The people we're talking to, they too know that we're lying. But it's not just that we do stuff like that. Sometimes what we do is we suppress what we believe in the hopes that we will fit in. I mean, have you ever done that, changed a part about who you are so that you could fit in with this group of people? All right? So when we try to coexist with what's wrong in the world, we end up trying to justify our wrong behavior or we try to give up the important parts of who we are and try to fit in. Both of those are losing prospects. Both of those are things that will hurt us. And Scripture says, the one who says, I have come to know him. Now, this is John talking, so who's the him? Jesus. The one who says, I have come to know Jesus and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So nobody woke up this morning and says, you know what? I want to be a liar. Nobody woke up and said, I want someone to say that he is an untruthful person. But when we try to coexist with what's wrong in the world to make it a part of who we are as Jesus people, there's a problem. Because the Bible tells us that if we say we've come to know him and don't keep his commandments, we're liars. Truth is not in us. So... If you've adopted the world's way of thinking rather than God's, then you might want to take a hard look at your life this morning. Is that who you want to be? Is that the way that you want to be? Jude goes on. He doesn't just talk about coexisting. Jude says that people believe that they can actually reject past truth because it's not relevant today. Oh, that's the Bible right? Or, oh, that's the way my grandparents used to think. They don't know anything. They were a bunch of rubes. I mean, you know what I'm saying? We think that just because it's older or that it comes from somewhere else that, man, we don't have to do anything about it. It's just not relevant. We are more intellectual and inclined today, right? We know things that, well, our forefathers did not know. The phrase long beforehand marked out 
describes an action of the past that has a continuing impact on the present. So what Jude is saying is the truth from long ago, it's still relevant. Why is it still relevant? Because the truth from long ago didn't just impact these people, it keeps impacting people. It's almost like truth doesn't change, right? That what is true then is still true now. It's almost like it's society and people who change, not truth. You know, we heard the verse earlier that, you know, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, God is truth, is he not? He is. His truth does not change. The world does, but it does not. Some in the early church thought they didn't have to believe or value what was taught in the past. And Jesus, well, corrected and said it this way, Do not think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill, to fill full of meaning. Jesus is the ultimate revelation of who God is. See, that's why we don't have extra new books of the Bible. God's revelation is complete in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the ultimate fulfillment and demonstration of who he is. How is God love? Jesus was love. How does he love? Well, he sacrificed everything for us while we don't deserve it, but he did it anyway, right? God in human form that we totally can relate to and understand. The past truth is always still relevant. The phrase long beforehand marked out also means something that is openly illustrated for all to see, something whose results are verifiable, proven through past experience. So how do we know that this truth is real here and here and here? Because each time it's tested, each time it's lived, it proves to be true each and every time. It's very viable. I mean, in Oklahoma terms, it's that we know that in certain seasons, certain seasons start at certain times because that's the way it has been. You can mark your calendar by it, okay? God's truth is even more dependable than that. It's constant so that when he says he is this way, he is this way to this people, and he is this way to all people. Jude adds that those who reject the truth are condemned. And we go, oh, whoa, condemned, ouch, don't like that. In fact, he talks about how they were beforehand marked out. And we're thinking, do these people not have free will? Is there not choice? It's not that they didn't have a choice, okay? It's that they ignored the truth and their actions provide the evidence to convict them. Okay? And so the way they acted showed that they were marked for condemnation because their actions demonstrated that they were guilty, open for all to see. We can go outside, and I can tell you that the sky is green with polka dots. Okay? And you can look up at the sky. And you can either choose to agree with me that it's green with polka dots, or you can say, no, Pastor, you're crazy. It's not green with polka dots. We know because we can go out there and we see the verifiable truth of what the sky is. God's truth is the exact same way. We can proclaim it to be all that we want it to be. We can try to change it and twist it and do stuff. But God's verifiable truth speaks for itself. And so it's verifiable for all to be able to see. Other scripture says it this way. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. He is the one to whom we are accountable. Since God has breathed life into all scripture, then scripture is useful for teaching us what is true, correcting our mistakes, making our lives whole, and training us what to do that's right. 
So the truth of the past is totally relevant today. It has real life-changing components that's real for us. So if you dismiss God's truth because you think it's outdated or because it's not culturally significant, then you might want to take a hard look at yourself this morning. You might, because we don't like to hear it, but it might be that you're the one that's wrong and not God. Thirdly, Jude says this. People decide that they can pervert and exchange the good things of God for self-satisfaction. That we think that we can just say, I don't need this, or I can twist this and make it how I want it because, well, it suits me better. I like it better. It's more agreeable to me. The phrase, turn the grace of God into licentiousness, depicts the conscious choice of an individual in exchanging the gifts of God for something diminutive or lesser, that they ultimately give themselves over to what is debased or wrong. The best way to kind of say this is sometimes what we do is we take the manifold awesome things of God and we say, ah, but I like this because it's just, well, you know, it's so much less. It's not as cool as that, but I like it better. And we do that with God's truth all the time, you know? No, I don't want to drive in air-conditioned comfort in this vehicle to go somewhere. I would rather sweat it out on this bicycle, not because I'm exercising, but because I want to adopt this as my way of forever transportation everywhere I go. And I want to get all my, you know, groceries on my bike and do all this. And I'm not, I'm not making a big deal about bicycle. I'm just saying, why give up that which is awesome and better for something that is less useful, less functional, and less good for you? We can think of all sorts of different things in the world that we do that with. Why would we want to do that with God? Why would we want to take the awesomeness of God and say, I'm going to worship, serve, and be like this? It's less. It doesn't do anything for me. But yet we do that a lot. And so some in the early church thought that the freedom that they had in Christ allowed them to live without any boundaries. Okay? Now, as Baptists, we've heard this said. Well, if you're going to say that you have security of the believer, that you, know, you believe that once saved, always saved, right? Nothing can pluck you out of God's hand. That if I'm a Christian, then... I can live just however I want, right? I don't have any boundaries. I mean, it sounds good, but I would counter and say, well, if you're truly saved, then you're going to keep his commandments, right? So while Paul does teach that I am free to do all things, I also have to realize that while all things are lawful, not all things are profitable. Just because I can do a thing doesn't mean I should do a thing, or that I should want to do a thing. You follow me? And so, yes, I have the opportunity to live as sinful as I want, but if I am a believer, I should have God's attitude about sin. And what does the Bible tell me that is? God hates sin. Why does God hate sin? Because sin is evil. Sin hurts. Sin corrupts. Sin is painful. Now, I'm not talking about sinners. I'm talking about the actual act of sinning. Okay? God does not want us to be a part of that. Jesus says this, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Does that sound like a life with boundary? It does. Now, it's boundless because it's in Jesus but there is an expectation that if I say yes to Jesus and his ways, then I have to take up my cross. Well, what does that mean? I have to be willing to die to something. What? My old way of life. I have to be willing to die to sin. If I'm going to take up my cross and follow him, that means I have to go in the direction that he's going. So that if Jesus is going that way, where should I be? I should be right there with Jesus. Because if he's here and we're talking and we're interacting, then that's awesome. 
If I'm a little bit behind him, well, that's still, I'm okay, I'm close, but am I hearing everything? Am I benefiting? And if he's going that way and I'm off over here chasing after rabbits, okay, well, then I'm totally missing everything, right? So, take up our cross, deny ourselves, follow him, not change it to my liking. See, the phrase, turn the grace of God into licentiousness, also describes those who reject the goodness of God in his favor, preferring instead to indulge in sensual behaviors and militantly advocating that others accept and do it the same. Now, that's where we are as a culture right now. Because we have wrapped up everything into the concepts of sensuality or sexuality. So much so to the point that it's, it's changing the way we even look at love. Okay? I can love a lot of people. I can love people who are my brothers and are my sisters and have no idea of taking that any place it shouldn't go, right? But the world doesn't see it that way because it has equated love and sex to be the exact same thing, and it is not. And so we live in a society now that defines everything sexually and is now crazy militant about demanding that you accept the world's definition and view of those things. Ouch. Jude's telling us, man, we don't need to pervert and exchange that. See, other scripture says this. It's found in the book of Romans. It says, professing to be wise, they become fools. For they exchange the truth of God for a lie, and that they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. So catch that. When we choose to exchange the awesomeness of God for something of our own making or our own design, what we're really saying is, hey, look how smart I am. Really, I'm dumb. Right? Professing to be wise, we show ourselves to be fools. When we do this, when we ignore what God wants for us, Paul writes in this, in this passage that God gives us, us over to our degrading passions. That what we do is that women and men exchange their natural functions for each other. All right? It goes on and we abandon natural function. And so we receive the penalty of our error when we do that. But not just that. Verse 28 of Romans 1 tells us that we didn't just see fit to not acknowledge God any longer, that he also gives us over to a depraved mind, to things which are proper, that we are filled with unrighteousness, that we are wicked, greedy, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, that we're even gossips, that we're slanderers, that we hate God, we're insolent, arrogant, boastful. This one's awful. Inventors of evil. You mean as a people we invent ways to be evil? Uh, yeah, we do. We're even disobedient to parents. That's why it says at the end of verse 30. Without understanding, we're untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinances of God, those who practice such things are worthy of death. And they not only do the same, but they give hearty approval to those who practice. Now, I say all that to say this sensuality thing isn't just about sexual acts. It's about everything that goes along with that idea of exchanging the awesomeness of God for what we think is best. Man, there's some nasty stuff written there in Romans chapter 1. And the sad part is, when we exchange the awesomeness of God for something less, that's what we're saying we want. Was there stuff in that list that you just said, oh, yeah, let's go do that after church? No. So, if you are rejecting God's ways for something that you prefer, then you might want to take a hard look at yourself this morning. Just saying. So, Jude makes it clear that those who do these things are ungodly. Duh and that they are denying Jesus. Do we want to be a people who claim his name and then say we want to deny him by our actions? The answer to that is no. 
Okay, we don't want to be that kind of people. We don't want to do that. And so Jude continues with a few things for us this morning. After making these statements about how this is what turning the grace of God into licentiousness means, okay, after saying these things, these things, he follows these things up with warnings from the past that should cause us pause. He's going to give us some warnings that if we pay attention we can see how not to do these things. Look with me at verse 5. He says, Now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for judgment, for the great day. Verse 7, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as those who indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as examples in under, uh, undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So he's showing us these problems of the past and he's showing us these errors because these errors that we just read about, I mean, they can show us answers of how not to turn the grace of God into licentiousness. So it's not just a message about, hey, and don't do these things, but how we cannot do these things. So the people of Israel in verse 5 that we just read about tried to coexist with wrong. God had saved them, right? You remember the story of the Exodus, the Passover. They left Egypt, slaves to free people. God called them out of Egypt. They were to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation set apart for his purpose. But what did they do? Over time, they expressed the desire to go back to Egypt. Man, don't you remember what it was like in Egypt? We had those three square meals, and we had plenty of work, and well, we didn't have to think about what we were going to do today because, well, the taskmasters, they told us. Seriously, they did this. So this is what they did. They took all the gold that they wore and the plunder from Egypt. They decided, let's make a cow. We'll make a cow out of that. And while we make a cow out of it, Let's worship the cow. That sounds like fun, right? So they did. They took this cow, they worshiped it, and their idea of worship is they mimicked all of the ungodly behavior that they saw the Egyptians do, right? So they pranced and they danced and they drank and all sorts of debauchery because that's what God wanted for them, right? Not. And so those who still wanted their wrong to coexist with them after they were caught, after Moses told them about the foolishness of their ways, well, those who still wanted to coexist, well, they died because God hates sin. They chose death over living with God. So that means when we try to coexist, what we're really saying is, I like the ways of sin and death more than I like the ways of Jesus. Scripture says this, do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members of instruments of righteousness to God. Romans 6.13 says that. So here's the three takeaways that we can see from the people of, of God here. Don't try to coexist. You want to walk away with something this morning? Let's walk away with that. Don't try to coexist. Instead, give your attention of your life to God. That's what it means to present yourself. Present yourself to God. Give him your full attention. Let him be your focus. Use your life as an instrument to do right. An instrument of righteousness is you saying, okay, Jesus bought me and paid for me, right, on the cross, I want him to use me in an awesome way. All right? Guys, you have favorite tools? You know, when you go to do something, you look for just that one screwdriver? I mean, you might have a whole deal of Phillips head screwdrivers, but you go for that one because, well, you know, if someone special gave it to you, it fits in your hand just right, whatever reason, it's never failed you. Yeah, okay? The idea here is we are to be useful. 
God saved us to do great things in his name. That's what we need to do. So let's move on from the people of Israel, because Jude brings up this thorny idea talking about fallen angels, right? Okay, fallen angels prove the error of rejecting the relevance of past truth. We're going to see through Scripture, just real quick, how if we pay attention, we cannot mess up and do what they did. Because when you think about it, angels were God's messengers. That's what the word means. All right? They were reflectors of his greatness. I mean, that's what Lucifer did, reflected the glory of God. But what happened? Well, they thought that the light of God that they reflected maybe emanated from within them. Maybe they thought that the message that they shared was their message and not his. And so we read in Scripture where a third of those choose to rebel and they fall. All right? And so they reject their purpose. They lost their place. They earned their punishment of forever judgment. They chose sin. That picture, that picture is us too. God created us with a great purpose. And yet we see in the garden we gave it all away. And we've been paying for it ever since. So look at the pattern of scripture through the ages. Job proved Satan wrong. See, Satan said, well, Job only worships you because you give him everything. And Job ended up worshiping God, not because of the cool stuff he had, but because of who God is. Yes, it was a process, but Job proved faithful. Job proved Satan wrong. Not just that, but the angel Michael overcame hindrance of a demon to minister to Daniel. And so we see that while demonic forces that we don't like to talk about, they're real, we see what? God overcomes that. Evil does not win. Not just that, but how about Jesus himself? Did Jesus not resist and refute the devil before he started his public ministry? So what do we see from the truth of the past? We see that, yes, evil exists, but evil does not win, right? God is the one who wins. And so when we realize that God does not fail... We can rely on scripture that tells us don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so what does that mean? We are instruments to do awesome things. So for whatever was written in former days, was written for instruction, that through endurance and encouragement of scriptures, we can have hope. What's the takeaway? Don't ignore the past. Don't ignore the testimony of Scripture. If I'm going to tell you, first off, don't coexist, don't ignore that which you know to be true. Because what does this passage tell us? It tells us that, well, it was written for our instruction. And so th if God went to the trouble to give you what you call the Bible, a collection of 66 books written over thousands of years, multiple languages, but yet passed down, and is translated almost into all known languages that we know. Not quite getting there, but we're getting there. And that the translation that you have is completely trustworthy and reliable, and it dates back closest to its original author than any other work in human history, and it doesn't contradict itself, do you think it might be trustworthy? I've watched movies written by smart people, have so many plot holes in it that you just can't get past it, right? Do you think that we could write a book that spans thousands of years and not contradict itself? Could we do that? We could not. But who did? God did. So if he went to that trouble and yet we have that copy right here today in your lap, I'm going to posit the, the idea to you that it's trustworthy. And you need to rely upon it. So much so that you base every detail of your life on it. Because it's the only words that have the ability to save your soul. Lastly this morning, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, ouch, you know, they perverted and exchanged the good things of God for self-satisfaction. I mean, we, we understand what took place there. I mean, we realize, I hopefully you realize, that God did not want to have to destroy those cities. That his judgment 
was based upon their refusal to repent. How merciful was God in that? He told Abraham, if I can find ten people, ten righteous people, I will save that city. I mean, remember how Abraham bargained with the messenger of God? We got down to ten. I mean, I look at you in this room, okay? I know, I know you. I know your stories. I can find ten people who are going to qualify to be the righteousness of God in just this room. I'm not talking about a city of a, thousands upon ten thousands of people where they couldn't find ten. God did everything to show mercy, and they rejected. Well, what goes on with this here? The people of these towns gave themselves completely over to fornication, doing opposite of their created purpose, and became examples of punishment for those who choose to do the same. Now, we could camp out and spend forever here, but here it is broken down to its simplest truths. We need to understand that any, catch that, any sexual expression outside of biblical marriage is fornication. Okay? I'm not just cherry-picking sins here. I'm just saying anything outside of biblical marriage is fornication. That rejects the purpose of God. This way of thinking and acting exchanges the truth of God for a lie, and it impacts us. It impacts the way we think. It impacts the way we try to justify all sorts of unrighteousness. All right? And so anything outside of that. That's why Scripture tells us this in the book of Hebrews. Let the marriage bed be held in honor among all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. All right? Now, God gives us hope. Because we realize that in that situation at Sodom, right, that Lot and his family, they fled. They were saved. We have the opportunity to repent. We have the opportunity to be different. And so I wanted to simply say, we don't want to pervert and exchange the awesomeness of God for anything less. Don't dishonor yourself. Pursue faithfulness and fidelity. Choose what is approved by God. You know, you think that God maybe designed our relationships? Man, woman, right? You think he knows what's best for us? Yes. Yes, he does. So today, Jude has warned us. Jude has warned us about the past, all right? He, he's warned us that we don't need to take our faith lightly because it will impact us. And so I want to ask you, your faith that you have in Jesus Christ are you taking it lightly? Are you exchanging the grace and the awesomeness of God for something that is so much less licentious, bad? We don't have to do that. As followers of Jesus, we've chosen him over everything in all the world, and we should realize that his truth is perfect for people of any age. And so if it is, why would we want to give that up? So, if you can't say that about yourself, then this is the simple thing I want to tell you. You just need to repent. Now, we think that repent's a big, ugly, bad word, but it's not. We think of the act of repentance as, well, it's awful. I'm being marked with shame. No, it's the fact that you're acknowledging that God's way is the best, and why would I not want to be a part of God's way? There is no shame in repentance. If there was shame in repentance, then why did God call people to repent? It's the means, the method, the avenue that he gives us to be right. And so if there's something in your life that you need to deal with today, do that. Repent. I want to ask you to bow your heads and to close your eyes, and we're going to have a moment of invitation, an opportunity for you to respond, whether to repent, or maybe you realize this morning that you're not a Jesus person, that you're not a follower of Jesus. Guess what? You probably already know that you're not good enough to coexist because you've already failed at it. So you can give that up. You already know that you don't have all the answers that you need for yourself because, man, you've tried all of your own truth. I mean, honestly, aren't you tired of two and two equaling five? Because it doesn't. Give up 
what you think's best for you and choose Jesus. You already know that you aren't satisfied with the things that you're doing. People without Jesus are not satisfied. We, we, we pretend it a lot, but man, I'm not satisfied. Let Jesus, let Jesus exchange your bad with his good. He will totally change your life. Jesus is the only one that can make you right. Jesus is the only one whose truth will set you free. Jesus is the only one that can give you real purpose and direction for your life. So are you willing to stop wasting your life and ask Jesus to save you? Whether you need to repent, whether you need salvation, whether you have questions, any of those things, I want to pray, come forward, and I'll be happy to talk with you about the awesomeness of my Jesus and what he can do for you.